If you've watched any of my other videos, you'll know that I, I tend to restrict myself to making videos only about navigation, land navigation, with a, a map and a compass. But obviously, when we're out navigating around the hills, we all know sometimes it's warm and sometimes it's cold. And a big factor in this is the wind speed and the humidity. And I've just, literally half an hour ago, finished a, uh, a navigation course, a novice navigation course, in this area. I'm in the West Pennine Moors, by the way. And one of the participants, Mike, hi Mike, <laughs> he asked me, could I explain exactly what wind chill is? Um, because he didn't really understand it. So I thought I'd answer the question in a video and give you the truth about wind chill. Now, as I said, I was only asked this question sort of half an hour ago, so I haven't really had a chance to think about it. So I'm sure somebody will post a comment if I make any mistakes, which I probably will. <laughs> now, we've all seen the weather forecast where the weather forecaster will say, or the presenter will say, the temperature is something, but it will feel like, and then another temperature, which is lower. And it's this feels like temperature, which is the wind chill. Now, let's start at the very beginning and look at exactly what wind chill is. And then we can look at how this feels like temperature is actually how it's worked out. So we all know that if you go out into the wind, it feels colder. But if you, I don't know, you go indoors or you put on a windproof jacket or shelter behind a wall or something else, it feels warmer. Even though the temperature hasn't changed, it actually feels warmer. As a, I'll give you an example. As an example, on this hand here, I have a glove, and I don't on this hand. This, it, as you can see from the string, it's very windy up here, so this hand feels a lot colder. And the reason for this is that my skin, which is normally, I think, between 33 and 37 centigrade, which is around, so I'm 33, I'm What's that? That'll be 92 Fahrenheit to 98 Fahrenheit. Well, my skin is warm and it warms the air just above my skin. And this creates an insulating layer. But on a day like today, or any day when there's any wind, the wind will blow away that warm insulating air and replace it with more colder air. So my skin then has to warm that up, which is blown away, and then I have to, my skin has to warm up the next lot of air, and it keeps going on. And the warm air of, that my skin is creating is continually blown away. So if you think about heat as energy, you can see that my skin is putting out energy, and it's being taken away by the wind continually. So my skin only has so much energy and it keeps using it and eventually this reduces and reduces the amount of energy I can put out as my skin gets colder and colder and so therefore my hand gets colder and colder until it's the same temperature you know as the, as the ambient temperature. Obviously the best way to stop this happening is to keep the wind from blowing over my skin in the first place as this will stop the warm layer of air from being blown away so the warm layer of air which is insulating my hand will stay where it is and my, my hand won't get any colder. Now the simplest way of doing this is you know when you're walking out in the hills is to put on a windproof jacket or windproof clothing or a hat or some gloves and mind you if you're walking on a warm sunny day you know and there's just a gentle breeze and you you won't want to put on a, a full set of windproofs and hat and gloves and all the rest of it because even though the breeze will still cool you down it's only by a small amount in fact on a hot sunny day which we don't have many of in uh, England by the way you know you may actually want the breeze there you may want it to cool you down so wind chill will cool you down but by different amounts depending on the wind speed, the air temperature, the moisture, you know, the clothing that you're wearing. There's lots of different variables. Oh, the reason moisture is important in this function is that water is much denser than air. If you think about like, if you think about it like this, when my hand is in the air, there are a certain number of air molecules that my skin needs to warm up. But if there are any water molecules, like rain, mist, fog, you know, that sort of thing, touching my skin, there is a lot more water molecules in the same area 
than there would be air molecules. So my skin has to work harder, it has to put out more energy to warm up the water. So my hand gets colder much quicker. Okay, so that's why moisture will cool you down quicker than uh, dry air. Now, so we know that moisture will cool you down, but how much will it cool you down? How much will the wind cool you down? So we'll go through that now. Now, I think it was in, I'm trying to remember here, 1941. Somebody will tell me if that's wrong. Two Americans, there was a geographer called Paul Sipple and his friend who was a geologist called Charles Passell, I think his name was, Charles Passell. And they were working in the Antarctic and they wrote an equation which was called the wind chill factor. And basically what they did is they suspended a small plastic container filled with water, which was, you know, from a cross that was on the roof of their building in the Antarctic. So it was 10 meters above the ground. And they just recorded how long it took that water to freeze in, in different wind speeds. But just like in a game of Chinese Whispers, which we've all played, the more Sippel and Passel's formula was quoted, the more it was changed. The original formula and tables have been quoted, they've been misquoted from misquotations, they've been amended for local conditions, they've been misunderstood by TV weather presenters. <laughs> you know, all the time over the year. So, what I'll do, for the sake of historical accuracy, when I get home, I'll, I'll put Sippel and Passel's uh, original formula on the screen. And this, this is it, hopefully you can see that. And if you put this um, formula into Excel, you, you can run it through, and, and this is the chart that it comes up with. Again, I'll, I'll do this when I get home. You can look at the ambient temperature and the wind speed, and you'll see what temperature water will freeze, you know, 10 meters above the ground in the Antarctic. Now, it's easy to pick holes in any formula, you know, and testing methods. Uh, as an example, you can see that it vastly overestimates the cooling effect of the wind. And this, you know, this f formula also fails at wind speeds over 50 miles an hour. But you have to remember that they were in the Antarctic, so they didn't have the luxury of a uh, full laboratory, you know, to do their testing. So I say, you know, well done to them. You know, at least they came up, you know, with the first usable idea of how fast something will lose heat in certain conditions. But here's the thing, which most people don't know, and most people don't seem to care because they use maths for their own reason. But as I say, here's the thing, this formula was never meant to be used for humans. You know, <laughs> to put it simply, a human body doesn't lose heat in the same way as water does. I, I'm not going to go into it, but it, it just doesn't. A human body generates its own heat, water doesn't. You know, this, it's, but over the years, of there have been many attempts to change this formula, and but most of them use Sippel and Passel's original test results, which means that, or meant that the the new formulas were also wrong. And even though they were obviously wrong, they were still used and quoted in TV weather reports just to make them more dramatic. As as you can tell, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll show you where I am at the moment. It, it's extremely windy here. Let, let me just move the camera. I don't know if you can tell from the video, but it is extremely windy up here today. I'm, I'm on the West Pennine Moors, and this area is called Two Lads. It used to be... <laughs> Two Lads, by the way, is... There's a cairn just down there, and you can see behind me there's a very large cairn there, with the remains of another very large cairn just in front of it. This area used to be called Wilder Lads, because the, this area, a few hundred years ago, was called Wild Boar Clough. So wild boars is like hairy pigs. Um, if in, wild clough, by the way, is um, it's an old English word, and it, it's uh, old English was the language which was spoken in this area between about 450 and 1100. So just after the Romans left and before the Normans arrived, um, a clough means it's a ravine or a thin valley in the side of the hill. 
Okay. In about the year 950, King Edgar was in charge of this area, and his two sons were killed here. You know, just literally there. And rather than burying them um, in that, I don't know what they did in those days, but they built these large cans over the top of the bodies. And it's said that the bodies are still, well, one of the bodies is still underneath the remaining can. How it, I've always said, if you go to virtually any part of England, within a short distance, something interesting has happened over the years. <laughs> it's just <laughs> started waffling again then, didn't I? <laughs> Let's stop this waffle, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> Normans, Romans, Anglo-Saxon kings, dead princes. Well, let's, <laughs> let's get back to Windchill. So, anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. in, the, in the year 2000, um, a committee was formed in America, and its name was the Joint Action Group for Temperature Indices. Only a bureaucrat would come up with a name like that. Joint Action Group for Temperature Indices. I don't know. <laughs> I'll just call it JAGT. Now, JAGT was asked to look at wind chill, you know, from a modern perspective, and most importantly, to come up with a new formula which would tell how cold wind would make a person feel, you know, as opposed to a suspended cylinder of water 10 meters above the ground in the Antarctic. And so what they did is they used a cylinder, a forward-facing cylinder, about the same size as a human head, and it was facing directly into the wind, which today is that way. The reason they did this is the forward-facing section of the cylinder corresponds to the human cheeks and you know on your face and this is normally the coldest part of your body in normal conditions so JAGT provided what I would say was a worst case scenario now this is just my personal opinion so it must be wrong <laughs> it must be wrong all my opinions are wrong but I would say that this the JAGT formula was created for people who don't go walking in the hills you know which many people watching this video do you know we do it all the time we're always up the hills and the reason for this is that you can see one of the main things which we all know that makes us colder is moisture you know like snow rain mist fog etc you know and the JAGT function, their, their new wind chill equations, don't include any reference to moisture. You know, I know that if I'm out in the rain, I get colder than if it's not raining. But the the wind chill in indices, <laughs> indices, I like that word. The wind chill formulas don't make any reference to moisture, which is, uh, you know, but at least. It, what it does is it, it, it gives you an idea of how cold it may feel. Again, it's easy to pick holes in, you know, mathematical functions. Um, but the JAGT one is, is only correct for a very specific set of circumstances. You know, if you, it, don't forget it was 1.5 meters high. So if you have a person who happens to be five foot four inches tall, and they happen to find themselves walking naked across an open field and a dark night, so there's no moonlight, then the wind chill formulas that they came up with, yeah, they may come in handy. You know, so you have to remember that the this feels like temperature that you see on the weather forecasts and, and the warnings and all the rest, they're just an indication. They're a worst case scenario, you know. But having said that, once again, just my personal opinion, one thing that all these formulas and functions and talking about wind chill, what it does, and it's very important, is it reminds us, people like us who go walking in the hills all the time, to always carry the correct equipment and the correct clothing and, you know, a hot drink and spare food and all the rest of it. Because, let's face it, the wind does blow <laughs> virtually all the time in some directions. So, I hope you found this interesting and thanks for watching.